got a mouthful of food. I'm so hungry. I had to, <laughs> I had to eat a Pop-Tart. And all of God's people said, well, amen. And that's what you'll have in heaven. In fact, I told Abigail she was going to go eat lunch today at El Maz, and she wasn't sure what to have. And I said, let me tell you what Jesus eats. He eats the chef's special. <laughs> Every time. All that cheese. Mm, it's only good for you in heaven. Well, week two of a series entitled <laughs> Race to Life. We're so glad you're here for it. And the whole purpose of this series is to show the practical reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, like Abigail just did. It's not just a historical salvation moment, although that cannot be denied. There's actually some very subjective, personal, powerful, passionate experiences that you and I can, should, and must have in light of the resurrection. That's the whole point. It wasn't just a moment. It actually touched off a movement. And that movement has some very practical applications in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. Last week where we started, we had to ground this series in the undeniable fact that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead. And the reason we got to ground it, that fact, while yes, the Bible says that God raised Jesus from the dead as well, the Holy Spirit is given credit for raising Jesus from the dead as well. Christ is the primary agent of the resurrection, his own resurrection from the dead, like he was the primary agent of creation from nothing in Genesis. And the reason we've got to accept that is because if he can pull that off, anything he says has got to be true. He promised it, he performed it, and then he's offered us promises in light of it. And if what he predicted actually happened, and the Bible very clearly teaches in all four Gospels, talks about it in the book of Romans, talks about it in the book of Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 13, that Christ raised himself from the dead, then what he says about our experience must be true as well. And what we learned last week is when Christ was raised, raised himself from the dead, he was raised into an irreversible condition. It was like cracking an egg. There's no going back. It, there's, it's no way to get that, that egg back in the shell. It's done. And that's what happens at the moment of salvation. We enter into a new irreversible condition. We're cracked eggs at that moment. There's no getting you back into the old person and the old ways. And that's the really what the focus of today is going to be about. But they also, the other thing is that we saw last week is that this new life is to happen immediately, not eventually. Now, there's an eventual reality to being saved. No question, that's heaven. But we don't have to wait to get to heaven in order to experience the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So today, we're going to talk about the state of the union, the union that you have with Jesus Christ and the depth of your connection should so profoundly be demonstrated in the depth of your change. I want to just give us really quick the three kind of conclusionary thoughts from last week, just to get everybody back on board, okay? Because a lot of Paul's writings are in a category of since then, since then. If this is true, then that ought to be true. If this is true, that ought to be true, okay? So since... Jesus has the undeniable power and authority to raise himself from the dead, then we can live in confidence of his promises to raise us from the dead. So just basically talking about the eventuality of our conquering death, the fact that Jesus proved he had the power to conquer his own should give you eternal sense of well-being. If you're truly connected, and we're going to see that today, then you can live very confident. Truly connected, undeniably confident, okay? You've been raised to an irreversible condition by the very same power that Jesus demonstrated to raise himself from the dead. So if you're in Christ, your eternity is secure. That is absolutely essential for good living. But it doesn't stop there, okay? Next, the irreversible reality of the eternal life started immediately. You've got to start living like you're going to live forever, right now. Remember we talked about Tim McGraw last week? A great song. Live like you're dying. Don't live like you're dying. Live like you're never going to die. It's a beautiful song. It's just theologically not accurate. Live like you're never going to die. Very different mindset because death has no hold on you. And last but not least then, since we believe in the one who alone has the power of irreversible life, then we have access to the power, purpose, and passion to live irreversibly, immediately. Irreversibly, immediately. Irreversibly, immediately. There is no going back, okay? Stop living like a dead person. 
Stop trying to unite your members with death. Stop uniting your members with things that have nothing to do with your new life, okay? Today, we're gonna join Paul, the great theologian in the book of Romans. And in chapter five, he's gonna do again for us what John did last week. He's gonna state some absolutes about you if you're in Christ. And the good thing about these is God doesn't care what you think. God doesn't care how you feel. They're true, okay? They're just absolutely true. Not that your feelings don't matter, but our feelings don't change the facts that God has declared about people that are in Christ. And these facts are necessary, okay? Because once you get these down within you, then changing and making changes in your life are driven by fact, not fear. You're not changing to be a good little boy or a good little girl. You change because you're a completely different person. You live differently because you are different. You live a new life because you have a new life, a life that's irreversible, a life that should start immediately. And that's what God is offering us. And so in the first portion, Paul's going to give you, just like we saw last week, declarative realities about the resurrection, declarative realities that Christ says about us. Today, we're going to see, if you will, the immediate result in the eyes of God from the moment you get saved. And then Paul in chapter 6 is going to say, if that's true, since that's true, and it is, then this should equally be true in your life, okay? So here we go. If you have your Bible, open to Romans chapter five. If you want to memorize, I told our youth yesterday, and the bold conference was outstanding, okay? Um, Usually the kids boo when I'm done. I actually got a quiet applause this year. So very, very thankful. I'm gonna go out on top too. I'm never doing it again. No, I'm only kidding. It was beautiful. You should see these kids worship. As soon as we strike the first chord, they're all at the stage. You would feel, like some of y'all be like, what are they doing? They're worshiping the Lord. That's what they're doing. It was beautiful, okay? But there's three great therefores uh, in the book of Romans, and one of them is going to be seen right here, okay? Today's big idea. If we are united with Christ, that's if. That's the if. Only you can answer that if. And the way you get united to Christ is the way Abigail did in my office yesterday, You believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, then you openly confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. She didn't get saved because she confessed it to me. She got saved because she confessed it and God heard it. And in that moment, she experienced irreversibility. Death has no hold on her. It's been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? She will die. Certainly every container stops, but she'll never experience death. Okay, death has no hold on her anymore. All because, now you gotta know, you, only you can answer the if. And if you are, then this should be true. If you're not, it's a different conversation, okay? We want you to be saved, we want you to be united with Christ. So if you're united with him in his irreversible life, um, the, then, that should be then, we can immediately rule and reign in our life. And this is the key, see, When you become saved, the Bible says you're a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus, okay? And what the Bible's trying to do is connect you to the original creation story. When Adam and Eve were perfected and you in Christ are now perfect, the book of Hebrews is very clear about that, having been once and for all perfected, you're perfect, okay? You are (laughs) perfect. I have a hard time saying that, but it's still true. You're perfect, okay? You got a, a, not just a new beginning, but you're a new creation. And what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden is, I'm going to give you the right to rule, reign, subdue, fill, and multiply. What was lost in the garden was recaptured in the tomb. And when you're born again, this is reestablished. You now have the authority to decide for yourself. Before, the Bible, will see, you'll see it today, sin was your master telling you what to do. My God, you'll do this. Now, you get to decide. Nobody gets to tell you what to do but you. So if you're in sin, it's because you chose to use the power that God gave you to rule and reign in a way that is not pleasing to him. But you don't get to say, I don't have any authority. No, no, no. Remember Easter? Uh You got all authority under heaven and earth. It's been given to him, and it's been given to us. So you and I immediately get to live differently. Immediately. Because of that, Romans chapter 5, therefore... Since we have been justified through faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Now, no need to dig too deep. I've highlighted different words for you in your outline. I hope you got it. The green ones are verbs. The blue ones are declarative realities. They're in different formats that I don't even need to go into, but the English does a really good job of talking about the immediate reality between you and God. Okay, the first one, I don't even have to tell you, since we have been, it doesn't say we might be, doesn't say we should be, doesn't say we will be. It says we have been, past tense. It's an aorist tense, which is like a snapshot moment, okay? You have been justified, all right? Now, it's important to understand what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean you've been found not guilty. It doesn't mean you've been declared innocent. Because you haven't been. You were found guilty. The reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty, right? I mean, it's just pretty, try and convince somebody they're not guilty when they know they're guilty as sin, as we would say, doesn't work to bring any comfort to any human being. The minute you and I committed our first sin, you went on trial in heaven. You were accused of committing sin. You were found to have committed that sin, and you, like Adam and Eve, were sentenced to death. The good news is that death penalty has been carried out. You aren't pardoned, okay? You aren't paroled. You were declared righteous because the justice of God has been served. You and I get to walk knowing that we are free of the penalty of death, not because God winked at it, not because God willing forgets it, but because God carried out your death sentence. He killed Christ, so he didn't have to kill you. So when the gavel dropped in heaven at the resurrection of Christ, and the moment you believed, God declared something about you. None of those innocent, none of that not guilty nonsense. Listen, if you were not guilty, then why did he kill his son? What a brutal thing to do if you weren't guilty. You have been declared righteous. A very different reality. And that means... We'll talk about the state of your change. That just means your standing has changed with God. Just like Abraham. When Abraham came out of the tent, all those stars into heaven, and God says, so shall your offspring be. The dude is 90 some odd years old, doesn't even have a child from Sarah. And he's saying, listen, that's how many kids you're going to have at 90. And you know what it says? He believed God. Okay. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay. Same thing to you. Your standing changed. You are now in right standing with God. You were tried, you were found guilty, sentenced to death, and that death sentence was carried out. So you gotta stop wondering when God's gonna strike you dead because he's not going to. You have an irreversible life. Irreversible, okay? So this declaration, that's what happens immediately. You gotta keep these two words, like write them down, tattoo them on your forehead. Well, I wouldn't do that, but do something with them. You're justified through faith, in the death of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not we will, we have it right now, present. And this isn't the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Paul talks about that, and that's the byproduct of prayer. This is peace with God. And what this word means is the absence of hostility, that two warring parties have laid down their hostilities. They now have a peace accord that they both agree they're not going to violate. So God has no hostile intentions towards you anymore. He's not angry with you. He's not mad with you. He's actually at peace with you. When God thinks of you, he thinks peacefully. Like internally, deep within his spirit, he's not troubled by you. He's like, no, no, they're not my enemy. They're my friend. They're my children. They're not my enemy. I have no hostility towards them anymore. And you, you, see, if you don't get that down and then you actually commit sin as a Christian, you're going to begin to think for God because you have be- behaved, if you will, in a hostile fashion towards him. Well, then, of course, the peace accord's off. He's going to act in a hostile, and that's not possible for God because you have an irreversible life. Okay, so you are literally at peace with God. And God's at peace with you. See, if you turn it into performance, it gets really jacked up. 
If all of a sudden you're living because of peace and not for peace, it's a very different story indeed, okay? Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. You're standing in his grace right now. Okay, and that's all because of the access that we have gained through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here's the next thing we do. We boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. And this is the eternal reality that one day we're going to be standing in his presence. Full experience of the fullness of his glory. And we're called, because we know we're justified, right? Because we know we're at peace with him. Because we know we stand in his grace. We should start boasting of the hope that we have. That literally chest up and baby, baby, I'm going to heaven. Bring it. <laughs> I mean, chest thumping, hand clapping, cheering, snot slinging, I'm going to heaven. What are you boasting in the hope of? It's the glory of God. And you get to boast about that. But not only this, we also glory, which is the same word as boast. We boast in our sufferings. Because as followers, we now understand death doesn't get the final say. That we see through the sufferings of Jesus Christ, it's actually productive. That according to the world, suffering takes, suffering takes, suffering takes. According to your standing with God, it produces. It actually provides something. It produces perseverance. So no more does the things that you have to go through in life have to take from you the things of life. They actually are now transformed into producing something within you. Perseverance, the willingness to do whatever you gotta do for as long as you gotta do it until God does what only he can do. The willingness to do whatever you gotta do for as long as you gotta do it until God does what only he can do. That's perseverance. You keep doing what you know you gotta do for as long as you gotta do it until God does what only he can do. And when you start doing that, you're going to develop something beautiful called character. You're going to develop the character of Christ. And then once you get that character, man, I'll tell you what that begins to produce. That produces hope. This unquestioned hope because you see the process working out. I persevered through that difficult time at work, through that health crisis, through the relational difficulty, the rocky patch in my marriage. I just kept doing the right thing. I did the right thing, the right thing. I kept doing what I knew I had to do, what I was supposed to do, until boom, God showed up and did what only he could do. And that's developed character within me. That's exactly right. And a person who lives like that should have hope, okay? I would say the opposite of that is true. You should not really have a lot of hope that things are gonna be different in your life if you haven't developed character. And if you're not developing character, I can tell you why, because you're not willing to persevere through the hard moments. You just want to quit. You want to give up. You want to alter it. You want to go around it. You can't do that. Okay? We've got to go through the experiences knowing this isn't going to take nothing from me. Good gracious, that's glorious. And that's what you immediately begin to experience when you're in Christ Jesus. And hope, hope will never put you to shame. You are not going to show up one day at the, at the so-called pearly gates that don't exist, but they will, I guess, to some extent. However, in the presence of God, God will be like, <laughs> I was just kidding. You ain't really saved. I made a different decision. I mean, I know you thought you were, and I know you got baptized, and woo, you did the best you could, but truth of the matter is, uh, <laughs> I changed my mind. Ain't happening. You are never going to be ashamed that you connected your life with Christ. You're never going to be ashamed in the hope that you have. Not going to happen. That's why it's imperative we get in our heads. Irreversible living. God is not changing his verdict, okay? And then he says, and I'll prove it to you. I've poured my love out into your heart through the Holy Spirit that I've given you. I don't know how much more we need, but Paul gives us just a little more. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Like, that makes me want to run through a wall, any wall, that I am saved from God's wrath that I rightly deserved. Why? 
Because Jesus begged his father in the garden, if you will, remove this cup from me. But thou will be done, not mine. And he drank the whole cup of God's wrath. There ain't another drop in there. I'm saved from it. Okay? For if while we were God's enemies, remember that hostility's gone now because you're at peace with him, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life, okay? Not only is this so, but here we go. We boast again in, in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's a beautiful reality that Paul puts together for us, okay? So the point is, there are immediate realities, whether you've comprehended them, ever thought about them. That's why Christianity is a thinking man's religion, okay? You gotta be willing to think rightly. Paul says in Romans 12, the same book, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves to God, holy and pleasing, W-H, holy and pleasing to the Lord, for this is your reasonable act of worship. No longer be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be renewed, by the transformation of your mind, okay? You got to think differently. You got to think biblically and that will affect you deeply. So here's just a list again, this is in your program. All of these are declared truths in about 11 verses in Romans chapter six. They are immediate realities at the moment of salvation. Immediate and irreversible. You have been justified, you have peace with God, you stand in grace, you boast in hope, you glory in suffering, you have his love, you have the Holy Spirit, you're saved from his wrath, you have been reconciled. If that is true, and it is, then that should affect how we live. And that seems to make perfectly good sense to me. Rather than guilt creating enough fear in you that you're like, oh my God, I don't want to go to hell. I know I'm saved, but I don't act like I'm saved. I don't even think like I'm saved. Ah! Pump the brakes. That ain't ever going to change a human being. What's going to change a human being is, let me explain something to you. Therefore, since I have been justified through faith, I am at peace with God. Through Jesus Christ, through whom I have gained access into this grace in which I now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we boast in our sufferings. Because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope, it'll never put me to shame. Now, I want to live different. That's a completely different motivation to live differently. Because you have a different life, that's why we want you to live differently. Not because we want you to be a good little boy, well, although we do. Not because we want you to be a good little girl, although that's not a bad thing. It's because you're a new person, okay? And that's why we want to live differently. Paul, Romans 6, great conclusionary thought. What are you going to say about that then? What shall we say? Well, Paul was concerned, some people would say, and most Christians today don't say this, but in Paul's day they did, what shall we say? Well, if God's grace runs that deep, why can't I just keep sinning? If I was irreversibly changed, I could pretty much keep on sinning. And you know what, that'll be an opportunity for God to show even more grace in my life. Can I, through my sin, make God look better? You know what I mean? Some of y'all make him look really good. I just need to tell you. And nobody more than I do. Okay, I need his grace every minute of every day. But to think that, you know what I'm gonna go do? I'm gonna go throw my life away so God has to keep rescuing me so people can see what a great lifeguard he is is a really ridiculous way to live. You would not do that, okay? Keep throwing yourself in the deep end of the pool and you can't swim. You know the old keep crying wolf, crying wolf, crying wolf? One day... Uh, he might just let you sink. And if you have this thinking, what I would say to you is you gotta go back to the, if we have been. Because the people who have the answer, yes, I have been, don't have thinking like this. If you have thinking like that, I gotta challenge your thinking. In fact, I think you ought to challenge your salvation. Because this is an illogical way to live. 
like trying to prove um, the power of the warden and his leadership in the prison is for you to keep getting arrested. So you can go there and say, I want to show the world how good he is at keeping people in prison. By doing what? Breaking the law. I'm going to break the law every chance I get, and I want to show everybody he's a good warden. And we would all be like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. You know how you can show he's a good warden? Never get arrested again. Go live a different life. Now that you're free, live free. Right. And you know what's so crazy? Is some of us as followers of Jesus Christ are free and we don't know it. And we've never started living like it. And that, how quickly did Jesus begin to live that irreversible life? If I ask you on the count of three, do you know the word? One, two, three, Immediately. Come on, man. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. You're wasting time. How can those who have died to sin, how can you live in that any longer? How would you want, like, I know it's kind of grotesque, and I don't mean to be emotional, but do you really want to climb down in the grave with that? You want to go do mouth to mouth with that? That old person, that old way. If you've never been around a body that hasn't, I mean, it, it's, it's woof. You give it about 24 hours and it's oof. I've been next to some that it's been a couple weeks until they were found in the woods. Mm. 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 Never forget that. So it's always fun. You want to deal with that stench-filled, maggot-ridden old person? You want to do mouth-to-mouth with that? Right. And you're like, you're disgusting. I know. Enjoy your lunch. (laughs) Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This is spiritual baptism, which water baptism physically represents. We say this verse, every these two verses, every time somebody gets back. Just say them. We're buried together with Christ through baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. A new life, okay? So don't you know? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You were spiritually united to Jesus Christ when he died. When he died, you died. There was official, I mean, an official uniting with you in Christ. We were therefore buried with him. We died with him. We were buried with him through baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new, irreversible life immediately. Did you know that? It isn't just that Jesus died, although that's true, obviously, historically true. That's why we got to start thinking about, but subjectively, spiritually, so did you. And when Jesus was buried in Joseph's tomb, so were you. You were spiritually united with him. When he raised himself from the dead, you were united with him. If you were united in his death, burial, and resurrection, don't you think it would be awesome to go live a new kind of life? The kind of life he's now living, I mean, different and distinctive. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, see, that's the key. If, if, for those of us that can say yes, we get a then. The great challenge for today is not, are we as followers living? But do you realize as a non-follower, you're dead? Don't ever let anybody tell you, you're just a bad person. God doesn't love bad people. Wrong. For God so loved the world, a world full of bad people. And he didn't send Jesus to make you a good person. He sent Jesus to die for you because you were dead in your sin. Not bad in it. And God didn't send Jesus to make you good. He sent Jesus to make you alive. Now, a person who's alive would want to be good and live differently. But if you're not in Christ, you're dead. We got to solve that problem. And you do that as Abigail did it. You believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead. Speak with your mouth that he is Lord. 
bam, immediately you're saved. You experience irreversible life that should be lived immediately and it will be experienced eternally. You got to make that decision for if. I wonder how many of you in this room right now are like, man, I'm going to come and tackle that TV. I'm so fired up because I'm an ifer. I'm in, right? We have been united with him. That's why with him in a death like his, we'll certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And I got to move on quick, I know. Have you ever thought about what his resurrection actually was like? Because we're united to a resurrection like his. So what's his life like? Well, he got resurrected from, he resurrected himself from the grave and he came out in this brand new, different, distinctive container, okay? He's now in a position where death no longer has a hold on him. Paul will write a little bit later in 6 that he will never die again. And since you're united with him, that's why I'm able to say to you, you shall never know death. See, see the 23rd Psalm, it's often used as a funeral dirge. I use it at the graveside because it's power, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You see, I'm gonna declare, I hope this is true for you, but death is merely a shadow for me. That's all it is. Doesn't have any hold on me can't stop me, doesn't scare me. You know what it proves to me? I'm walking towards the light. For me, death is that. It's a shadow. But you know what? The biggest word in the whole psalm is through. Through. I walk through the valley of the shadow. I'm not hanging out there. I don't live there. I'm not buried there. My eternity not there. How do I get through the valley? Thou art with me. Come on, Bubby. He's the one who walked through before me. So when it's my turn to walk through, who do you think I'm going to follow? My shepherd. The shepherd always knows where he's going. Come on, Greg. Don't fear this. Right? I don't fear no evil. Don't worry about that. It's just shadow. Look, dude. Come on, man. I walk right through. That's why people mourn and cry at the 23rd Psalm. (laughs) Boy, hell yeah, it's the saddest psalm I've ever heard. I'm like, man, it's victory. It's victory. I know, you think I've lost my mind. And to some extent, I had to. Because the old mind, you think this one's twisted? Oh my God, you should have seen me when I was getting stoned. It was not pretty. I'll be the first one to be honest with you. It was not pretty. Now, <laughs> that was terrible. should never have said that. Now, if we died with Christ, <laughs> but I did. You know that. I was a drug addict for 10 years, I, I, but I've been sober for 35. So I got three times, three and a half times the, yeah, that's not a bad track record. And you know why? Because God's good to me. That's why. And I want to live the irreversible immediately and continually till all eternity. I can't wait till the, just, just as the, the Lord comes and gets me, I can't wait to look at the face of the devil. And I, I'm going to be really vulgar, but I, I know what I'm going to tell him. And you can go straight to hell. Because I'm going to him, baby. Now, I would never tell a human that. I have no problem telling the devil that because that's Biblical. I can point to that in Revelation. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know, we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. You were united with him in a resurrection like his. Don't you go dare live like you're dying. Because you're in him, he's in you, he can't die, you can't die. Live like you're going to live forever. Get started now. Enjoy the immediacy of eternity and quit waiting till you get there. Because it is here, it is now, it is in you, you are new. Let's live like it, okay? 
Death no longer has mastery over him, nor over you. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, okay, and this is where the whole thing ends. If all of that is true, all right, I'm gonna give you a chance. If you believe everything that Paul has said in five and six, therefore, having been justified through faith in his blood, we are justified. We have peace with God, right? All of those beautiful things. I stand in his grace. I'm apart from his wrath. He's poured out his love. He's poured out his spirit. I have been. Um, I have been saved. I have been reconciled. All right? If in the same way, do you believe all those things that Paul listed to be true? You're going to say amen when I count to three, and you're going to say it really loud. One, two, three. Amen. All right. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, no longer because of sin. You're dead to it, no longer because of it. Something radical has changed. And Paul will go on to say in seven, anytime a a couple's married and one of the spouses would would pass away, the law, and rightly so, biblically speaking, the living spouse's obligation is cut. They can remarry, they can date, they can... Find someone else to love and do life with. And the Bible's like, absolutely. If a spouse passes, you have honored that obligation. We're dead to sin. We don't have any obligation to it anymore. You don't owe it anything. Quit trying to breathe life into something you died to. But count yourself alive to God in Christ Jesus. And obviously, this relationship can never end because neither one of you is ever going to die. So this covenant that you're in with God through Jesus Christ, the only way that that covenant could be separated because we're the bride of Christ is if one of its members died, leaving the other person the right to no longer fulfill its obligation because the obligation no longer exists. Do you realize that moment's never going to happen? Because God's not going to die. The, Paul just said, Christ Jesus is never going to die again. You ain't going to die. There we go. Live like that. Therefore, here it is. don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. All of that to come to this. You have the right to rule and reign in your life now. You are on the throne. Sin still resides within us, but it no longer reigns within us. It's kind of like before you were saved, it's like you and I were apartment buildings. Well, actually, we lived in one. And the landlord lived on the first floor. We lived on the second floor. And that would be no fun because then you can't do anything. You can't make any noise. constantly annoying you. Can't turn your stereo up too loud. Can't have your friends over. Just crazy. Okay, And that was what it was like when sin was in you. He was the landlord, and he lived on the first floor. And any expression of freedom you tried to express to do the right thing, do this, that, he was constantly torturing you. If you did the right thing, he told you you're goody two-shoes. You did the wrong thing, he said you're a worthless piece of junk. Constantly mouthing. But you know, it was his building. Couldn't do much about it. Then when Christ purchased you, sin is no longer the landlord. But the bad news is he still lives on the first floor. He's still there, still annoying, not the greatest neighbor. But now when he comes and knocks on your door and tells you to turn down the music, tell him to take a hike. When you're making too much noise worshiping the Lord, he said, I'm gonna call the police, you're too loud. Tell them to hit the road. I'm not the landlord anymore. He has no say in what goes on in your apartment. I know who the landlord is. It's Christ Jesus. 
And yeah, I got to live in the same building as you till I get called home. But listen, I ain't listening to you no more. I'm in charge. Shut your mouth and get away. Go down to that little spot in my life that you have. And you know what we do every now and then. We miss the, the old landlord, don't we? Go and knock on his door. Hey, man, what you up to? I don't know. What do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. Think about getting drunk. Well, come on in. The only way he's active in your life is when you knock on his door. Quit letting him be the landlord when you already have a risen Lord. His name is Jesus. Go make all the noise you want. Go run around the block and declare the fact that you know no death. Boast in the hope of the glory of God, I dare you. Start thumping that chest as you walk around and say, you know what? No matter what you see, no matter what you think, no matter what might happen, might not happen, or will happen today, I can tell you one thing today. I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's exactly right. And I'm telling you, all of a sudden, you begin to see sin differently. You're in a position to reign. It doesn't get to do it anymore. Stop obeying its evil desires. And all you got to do is go back to the original creation and exercise your sovereign right to rule, reign, subdue, fill, and multiply. But Adam and Eve were given a choice. And you can eat from the tree of life or not. Can I encourage you, please? Please? Do you see what man has done for, because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? We can't handle that knowledge. No, we can't. No, we can't. But I promise you, you can handle the knowledge of resurrection life. You can. Just do what Jesus did. Don't do what Jesus didn't do. When you mess it up, crawl back to the Lord. Say, please. And he's like, oh, stop begging. Stop begging. If I already forgive me, stop begging. Just repent. We're good. We're at peace here. We at peace. We're at peace. Are you still an if or are you a then? If you're a then, then this is calling us and compelling us to live differently. If you're an if, you got a problem. You're still dead in your trespasses. But you can become alive. Immediately and irreversibly by declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, we love you, and we love how you love us. All you've ever wanted for humanity was life. Life irreversible. But yes, Adam and Eve chose to introduce reversible death. Death has always been reversible. Because of your grace and your mercy, you choose to intervene and provide an irreversible opportunity if we in faith believe that Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead and he is in fact Lord, we will be saved. Father, we love you for making it so simple. In Jesus' name, we pray to you and all that God's people said, amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise in his house if you would. Whoops, I went one too many. May the God of heaven richly bless you. Go have a beautiful day. Enjoy the warmth.